So, uh, this last week was kind of um, upsetting. I guess this happened the weekend before, but um, did you guys hear about that video from uh, the, the student, or I guess the football players at Moline High School? And they had uh, one of the black players, they uh, evidently uh, forced him or threatened him to sit on a stool, like in a locker or confined space, with bananas hanging over his head. And uh, somebody videotaped it, and some kids were laughing. They thought this was just funny. And um, fortunately, the kid who videotaped it, or got a hold of the videotape, posted it. So now it's all over. Um, Fortunately, in one way that You know, we know this is going on and we can do something about it. It got reported and the state's attorney's office is involved. And and, uh, I don't know what their motive was, if they were just kidding around or whatever. But I'll tell you, it just makes my heart sink, doesn't it? It's like, wow, I can't believe this, you know. Um, and, And especially, you know, with our students having this kind of callousness or possible white supremacist beliefs and stuff and I just like "Ah, that is just so stupid I'm sorry you're not supposed to say stupid in church but it's stupid and um, anyway I bring that up because uh, I want to talk today about the justice of God and when stuff like this happens we cry out for justice we want the guilty parties punished and we want the, the victims to be um, taken care of. We want things made right. We want an end to this um, foolishness, this, this prejudice, this racism. And uh, so we express this in a lot of different ways as a culture. Even within the evangelical church, there's a lot of different ways to look at this whole issue. But one thing we all agree on is that God's justice is better than what we have. So many times what we get is a piece of justice, but not the whole thing, not the whole enchilada. And so I just wanted to talk about that today because we're, we're talking about the, the echoes of Easter. The, what Jesus did when he died on the cross, the instant that he gave up his life, as a sacrifice for our sin, he did a number of things. He, he, he uh, reconciled us to God for all those who wanted to be. And he, he gave us personal salvation, uh, a righteousness. He became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. But that's not where he, he didn't stop there. He did other things as well. And, and one of the things he did was... Uh, he satisfied justice. He established justice on on the earth. And and like I was saying, there's a lot of difference of opinion about, okay, what do we do about justice? Even saying the words social justice or <laughs> economic justice. Ooh, you know, those words make us very nervous and uncomfortable. And there, because there's, I think there's some confusion about that. And, but it, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, posit an idea that if we start with the gospel, we can understand justice in a more uh, thorough way, a better way. And so the gospel is, a, is the story of how Jesus came and died in our place and then rose again from the dead and made us part of his family, part of his movement, part of his kingdom. And so the establishment of justice and in that act is something that God did. But here's the thing about God and justice. When God establishes justice, when he does the right thing, he doesn't stop there. He keeps going. He, he moves on from there to forgiveness. And I think that's another thing we need to keep in mind as we think about justice in this situation. We need to think about forgiveness as well. We need to think about reconciliation. I, I can't get out of my mind. I'll, I'll never get over what happened uh, in, um, in that place. Um, 
I want to say Georgia, but I, I think it was uh, South Carolina. South Charles, thank you. So there was a prayer meeting and, um, in a black church, and a white kid came in and prayed with them for a while and then pulled out a gun and shot a bunch of people. And he was captured and put in jail. And the people that survived that prayer meeting, evangelical Christians, okay, went to the jail and offered Christ's forgiveness to this guy. So there was justice. He was in jail. He's going to pay for his crime. But the, it, it didn't stop there. It went on to reconciliation. And that's what God does. And we see this, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, we see this at the very, very beginning. If you go back to the beginning of the Bible, you see that um, God, this is the first instance of God's justice taking shape. And, and it is... Um, where we discover the need that you and I and our, our world has for justice, okay? This is, this is where it started. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent to eat of the forbidden fruit, the tree that they weren't supposed to eat from, the only one they weren't supposed to eat from. And uh, they, they were, they were uh, convinced by the enemy's lies, that, that it was a good thing to eat this fruit, that it would make them like God. And also to lie to them and convince them that God didn't want that for them. He was holding back. And so they fell for it and chose to rebel against God. And God had already clearly told Adam, in the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. See, there's the justice of God. You commit the crime, you do the time. And, and, that's, and God said that. And, and guess what? When they ate the fruit, God carried out the sentence. They began the process of death. And that from, from that moment on, everyone in history has died, unless they're still alive. Everyone who's born someday will die, unless Jesus comes back first. I think he's coming on Thursday, because that's when I get my second COVID shot. So it, it just you know my my luck, but anyway, but yeah, he until he comes back, we all die. And you go through Genesis, you go after chapter three and four and five, six, and the table of nations, and and you discover that that this person is born. He lived this long, had a son. And this person you know lived longer, and he died. And this his son lived this long, had a son, lived longer, and he died, and he died, and he died. Everybody died. And so the curse is real. And the curse was not just on humans. The curse was on the ground as well. One of the, the first thing that God said to Adam when he was carrying out his sentence was, Cursed is the ground because of you. Because you've listened to your wife and, and did what the serpent told you to do. Cursed is the ground because of you. That was God's justice. And so there it is. Uh, and verse 19 is, is one I, I wanted to put up here. Um, take a look at it. He says, this is the end of his uh, words to Adam here. By the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. But God didn't stop there. Okay. In fact, even before he pronounced this sentence of death, even before that, he spoke to the serpent first. Do you remember when God called out to Adam and he didn't want to come? He was hiding because he was naked and, and, and God called him out. And, uh, and so that he asked, what, what did, who told you to eat from the fruit? You know, the serpent did. Or, yeah, Adam said, the, the woman you gave me told me to eat. Typical. And, and then she said, well, the serpent told me. And the serpent's like, uh, he had nowhere to go. And so God starts with him. And he says this. Look at uh, verse um, 14. Then, God, the Lord, then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, he's talking to Satan, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause, watch this, I will cause hostility between you and the woman. 
between your offspring and her offspring. He, that is the woman's seed or offspring, will uh, strike your heel and you will bruise, I'm sorry, he will, I'm sorry, he will strike your head. I'm having trouble reading here. <coughs> he will strike your head and, or rather crush your head and you will strike his heel. In other words, he's going to step on you. And you're going to be crushed under his feet. Who's this person he's talking about? It's our Savior. It's the one who died on the cross to pay for this horrible sin of rebellion that Adam and Eve committed. So even before he pronounced his sentence, he's already provided a way for grace, a way for forgiveness, a way for reconciliation. He's already laid out, he's already set it in motion. This is who our God is. He is a God of justice, but he doesn't stop there. He goes on to grace and forgiveness. Okay, well, let's just kind of walk from there and see what we learn about justice. The thing is, we need justice. We discover this here because of the curse, because of the fall. We're incapable of bringing justice on our own. We need God's justice to have justice at all. And how do I know that? Well, Proverbs uh, 14, 12. In fact, uh, the book of Proverbs has this written twice in two different places, 14, 12 and 16, 25. So it's a pretty important principle that's laid out. It says, there is a way that seems right to a person, to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. That means when we know what we should do, when we know what's the right thing to do, and we're convinced of that, and we do it on our own, we're not getting any closer to life, we're not getting any closer to God, we're going to mess up. We're getting closer and closer to death, destruction, failure, all of that. We can't do it on our own. We are incapable of providing justice. That's why we're constantly crying out for it. Because no matter what we do, what kind of system we come up with, justice is always uneven. It's, it's not the same for this person or that person. And there's ways to get out of it and all that. It's, it's just a mess. It's a mess. Why? Because there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The fall took care of that. The rebellion of man took care of that. And because of that rebellious heart, that unwillingness to just say, okay, Lord, what should I do? And then do that. Our unwillingness to acknowledge the Word of God as the chief authority in our life. Our unwillingness to trust God's ways and His words even when they don't make sense to us. Because of that unwillingness as a race, as a human race, we are doomed to in, in, uh, imperfect justice at best. So we need justice, starting in Genesis 3. We need it, and it only comes from God. But not only that, all injustice in the world, all oppression, all evil, all of that, flows from this one act of rebellion in the garden. All of it comes from that one moment in time when Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden. How do we know that? Romans 5.12 is very clear. It says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. All sin, all injustice, all of that stems from that one act of disobedience. And because of that, we can't provide it for ourselves. Because of that, we will always, we're doomed to experience this our whole life that we're on the earth. Why do bad things happen to good people? Go back to Genesis 3. That's why. It's not what we want to hear, but it's the truth. All injustice Every kind. And I don't care if the, if the people involved are Christians or not. It doesn't matter. Every human being on the planet that's ever experienced injustice or ever worked injustice has Genesis 3 to thank for it. Because that's where it started. And all comes from there. But God didn't stop there, did he? The good news. 
all injustice, all sin, all rebellion against God was dealt with in one moment on the cross. Amen? So just as sin came from one man, Adam, and death through sin, for all have sinned, so through one man came life, came forgiveness. And when the instant that Christ died, that he said, to tell us die, it is finished, and he gave up his, his spirit on the cross, from that moment, <clears throat> excuse me, from that moment forward, God had settled it. He, had, he was satisfied. The word propitiation means satisfaction. <clears throat> so God who was owed justice was granted justice through Christ. And this is really well said in, in Romans uh, chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice, uh, propitiary sacrifice, satisfaction, the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. You ever about all the people that, that, um, that sinned before Jesus came? What about them? What, what about their sin? We know about our sin. What about theirs? He said God was being fair when he, he didn't punish those people in times past. Why? Because he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time, that moment on the cross. Their sin was forgiven by what Christ did. Those that chose to put their faith in God. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness or his justice. For he himself is fair and just. And he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. So now that the debt is paid... Justice is satisfied. The rebellion by the first Adam was undone by the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And now, justice is here. It's real. It exists. And not our justice. God's justice. In fact, you could say that all justice in the world, no matter where we find it, all justice in the world stems from that one act of obedience by Christ. Just as all injustice uh, comes from the act of disobedience in the garden, all justice now stems from that one act of obedience by Christ. And therefore, God's justice is here. Now listen to what uh, the Apostle Matthew said about Jesus. He's quoting uh, from an Old Testament passage in chapter 12, verses 18, 20, and 21. He says, and this is from Isaiah, he said, Here is my servant whom I have chosen. That refers to Jesus. This is in prophecy, 600 years beforehand. The one I love, in whom I delight, I will put my spirit on him, and he will what? Proclaim justice to the nations. That's what the Messiah would do. That's what Jesus has done. That is the good news. That's why we go and make disciples, because justice has arrived. God's justice is satisfied, and because it's satisfied, God is free to give us his forgiveness and grace. We don't have to pay because Christ paid and made things right with God so we can be right with God. That's what he's proclaiming. That's what you and I are proclaiming in his name. We are the hands and feet and the mouth, the body of Christ. And that's our message. Justice has been satisfied, and so God is free to forgive you and accept you no matter what. You don't have to earn your place with God. It's granted to you, free. No strings attached. You just have to want it. That's the only string. And God even gives you the grace to do that. Down to verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. He's gentle. Until he has brought justice through to victory. What does that mean? Until he has led justice 
to victory. Until the day when the justice of God is completely manifest. It's completely shown in the world. And you won't look around and say, where? I understand God's justice here, but I don't see it. All I see is corruption and and evil and oppression and, and all these things in the world. I see slavery. I see I see hatred. I see wars and, and, and people are not being treated fairly. I'm not being treated fairly. And by the way, I don't treat other people fairly, but I don't want to talk about that. It's too convicting. Okay. But where is it? It's what we say now, but he will be gentle to us. He will not judge us. Jesus is not judging you today. And neither should we be judging anyone? Amen? He is not even going to force a candle to go out. He's going to let things go as they need to go. As a gentle leader. Until the day when justice is finally complete. The day that he comes back. So right now, he is proclaiming justice. That is It has been satisfied. God is free to forgive and give us new life that lasts forever. And one day, he will establish justice. He will bring justice to victory so that justice will have won. No longer will we be crying out for justice. No longer will we say, well, half a loaf is better than none, I guess. We won't have to say that anymore. So justice is part of the kingdom, the ruling of Jesus on the earth. And like we said last week, the kingdom of God has an already but not yet character to it. And the justice of God is the very same. There's already justice because you and I can have salvation because of Christ establishing justice. And whatever justice we have today, whenever it's done right, we have Christ to thank. Because we are incapable of of doing it without him. And so that is the already, but the not yet is this unstoppable movement of history that will continue to go and go and go until Jesus at the right time returns and establishes his kingdom on the earth. He will lead justice to victory. That's the future. That's the hope. And you know, it's more than a hope. It's an expectation. We don't have to say, gee, I hope it happens. No, it, it will happen. It's already happened on the cross. It's just being worked out now in real time. Just like our salvation is fully complete on the cross. I have been crucified with Christ And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. It's a done deal. Yet we still struggle with sin. Why? Because it's a process. There's an already and a not yet to it. We must understand this. And the gospel is what helps us to understand it. The good news is that Jesus has established justice on the earth and one day it will cover the earth. And you and I are a part of it and you and I will see it. And I want to say, anyone watching here today, you will see that day. We'll talk about that in a minute. But all of us will be eyewitnesses to the victory of justice when Christ comes back. We'll all see it. God's justice is here. So, how do we engage this justice of Christ in our world? What do we do about this? How do we live it out? How do we apply this truth? It's a great truth, but what does it mean in my life? Well, I have three words of advice, I think, from Scripture about this. Like I said before, this really makes us nervous. Boy, we talk about social justice and, and all that stuff, and, and we're afraid it's, we're going to step over a cliff and uh, fall into, you know, stuff that we don't believe in, stuff that's not biblical, stuff that is anti Christian, you know, and that these ideas are gradually, it seems, 
rising in our world um, to the point where even our young people are more convinced of those things than they are of the truth of Scripture. And that's very sad. And we don't want to be a part of that. We don't want to urge us in that direction. And yet, God's justice is here. And so we have an obligation because that's good news. And Jesus, through us, is proclaiming justice. And Jesus is in the process of leading justice to victory. We cannot sit on our hands while that's going on. We have an obligation as part of our ministry. It's part of the gospel. And, and that's where I, I want to I stay focused on the gospel. Because three things. First of all, don't be afraid. When we start talking about doing things that could be classified as social justice, as an evangelical church, we have a history. If you go back the last 150 years, the history of evangelicalism, that is the, the section of Christianity that thinks that everyone needs to know the gospel. Okay? That's what makes us evangelical. That we, the Bible is our authority. The gospel is the truth, the central truth of life. Jesus is, in fact, the hinge of history. The Great Commission is our responsibility. It's our mission. That's what evangelicals believe, okay? That's it. That's what separates us from other Christians. The history of evangelicalism over the last 150 years has been riddled with this back and forth, up and down. There was a time at the end of the 19th century where the gospel itself was literally redefined as taking care of the poor, taking care of the sick, feeding the hungry. That was the entirety of the gospel. It was called the social gospel. And from the 1880s, 1890s, and sadly, people from our actual tradition, as, you know, as uh, Converge, Swedish Baptist, a guy named Rauschenbusch, who was a pietist, He came up with this, and it just turned everything on. It's like, oh, now I don't have to worry about my relationship with God. It's all about helping everybody else instead. Okay? And so from there, you have the social gospel. Now you have liberation theology, the same thing. It's taking the vertical and replacing it with the horizontal. And we don't want that, because those those, uh, beliefs are steeped in godless philosophy. And theories. We don't want that. That's destructive. That hurts people. What we do want, though, is for people to see Christ. And that is why we must be involved. Because here's, and this is why we should not be afraid. Because God commands us to do this. And the way He wants us to do this is a way where what we do is not an end in of itself. Okay? It's a means to an end. So if we feed the poor, if we hand out backpacks before school starts to, to uh, poor kids, to refugees, like we've done, if we do that, we do it for a purpose, we do it for a reason, and we're clear about that. We do it to point, not to ourselves, not to our church, but to point to Jesus. Jesus loves you like this. He He gives his life for free to you. So what we do must point back to Jesus. And that's what Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 5, 16. He said this, In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that, for this purpose, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So when we carry out acts of justice, we try to bring justice where it doesn't exist in the name of Christ, and we point back to Jesus, we are showing this is not an end in of itself because the the worst thing in the world is not that someone starves to death. The worst thing in the world is not that someone is, is, is wrongfully executed. The worst thing in the world is not that their body is destroyed. The worst thing in the world is that their soul is destroyed. And the body is important and all that, but Jesus did all the healing and everything he did to point to Calvary. He, he opened people's eyes because he wants us to open our eyes and see the truth that there's more to this life than what we experience. And the gospel is all about that. 
You may die. Your body may waste away and die. But if you know Christ, you're not dying. You're living. And people say, how can you do that? Well, you do it because of the Holy Spirit. Because God has given us the power to do that through his cross, the resurrection. We must do just things. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. To do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. It's required. But we have to do it the right way. And we must not be afraid. Because this is God's business. And I'm not going to let it be co-opted by people that think that the most important thing is what happens here on earth. I'm not going to let that happen. Are you? No. We're on a mission, brothers and sisters. We're here to tell the world that Jesus saves our soul. Our eternal soul forever. And we illustrate that by helping the poor, by healing the sick. Why do you think so many hospitals are named after, I mean, just think of the hospitals around here. Trinity, of course it's called Unity Point now. I guess we've gone Unitarian. Trinity Hospital, it used to be St. Francis, right? Franciscan, okay, whatever. Whatever. But it's, you know, hospital, Presbyterian Hospital, there's several of those around the world. Methodist Hospital, Baptist Hospital. Why? Because the church has understood that we visualize the healing that Jesus Christ did on the cross the instant that he died for our sins. That healing is illustrated as we reach out and take care of the poor. Give medical care to those who can't afford it. To help them to stay well. Why? So they can know Jesus. That's why. Not so they can have all in life that they deserve. Not so that everything can be equal. We can all have equal outcomes in our life no matter what we put into it. No, that's not it. It's so that people will see this is what Jesus did. Jesus has healed our world by his stripes. According to Isaiah 53. And so... We should not be afraid. We we should boldly serve in this way, but intentionally. Intentionally. And I'm I'm happy to say that as a church, you know, we have done this. You know, we've we've we got involved with uh, with some other churches in our uh, in our area that belong to the same converge group that we do, and um, did something every year called. Converge serve, and where we joined together and we did something. We we packed food for the hungry across the world. Um, we had uh, <clears throat> service projects. One one year, all the churches got together and we did a service project one Sunday in every school in the Moline Coal Valley School District on a Sunday morning. We did that. Why? Because Jesus loves you. We're pointing back to Him. We're doing it in his name. We're doing it so people will glorify God, not us. And in in that process, uh, one year we decided we wanted to go and and, uh, reach out to refugees that are here as a group of churches. And so we we decided, let's go. There's a huge uh, complex in Rock Island that has a lot of refugees. And it's really big. And someone said, you know, there's some other big churches that are taking care of that area. Why don't you try this place? It's a little smaller. It's called Maple Ridge in Rock Island. And so we decided, okay, let's all get together. We're going to throw them a block party. We're going to give away backpacks. Um, we're going to preach the gospel. And we had the gospel going uh, from several people, residents of the area, preaching the gospel in their own language. There were four languages being used to share the good news of Jesus Christ that day. So everybody knew why we were there. And everybody knew where the backpacks came from. They came from Jesus. Okay, whether they were Buddhist or nothing or whatever, they knew that this was done in the name of Jesus. And we did that intentionally. And and it's, it's part of bringing a piece of what the Bible calls shalom, peace. 
which is the way things ought to be, the way God has originally designed things to be. That's what shalom is. And try to restore things just a, a little bit, as much as we are able. And, and we did that. Now, let me just say something really important here. Because if you understand, okay, we all understand shalom the way the world should be. Because we long for that. Amen? I mean, no matter who you are, you understand this world is, is messed up. And it ought to be something else. We have a pretty good idea of what that ought to be. How we get there, everyone's got a different idea. That whether we can get there on our own, you know, we don't believe that as followers of Christ. But um, some people do. And they've, they've fought wars over it. But we all have this understanding of the idea. And then we understand then what the world is really like. The crime, the, the, the injustice, all these things. The, the death, needless death, disease, starvation, all these things. We understand. Human trafficking, we get that. That's what's in the world. And it's, it's all of that is even in our own country to some degree. We understand that. But you cannot go, and hear me, you cannot go from there to bringing God's justice. You can't go directly there. You can't go and point to a Savior who is not yours, who is not your Savior. You have to go through the gospel. You have to go through Christ. You have to become a follower of Christ if you want to be a part of extending God's justice into this world. You can only do it if you belong to Christ. You can't go directly there. Why? Because sin is in the way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And that's true for everyone at all times and all places. So unless you are redeemed through receiving Christ as your one and only personal Savior for all time, unless you are redeemed that way and regenerated and given this new life, you cannot be a part of what God is doing out in the world. You could join in. You can do things. You can make the world a better place for a while. But you're not going to see eternal results. The, the results that happen when God's people get involved. Because God takes what we do with our human hands and our feet and our, our mouth and all that. And he turns it into something that lasts for eternity. Sharing the good news to someone changes them literally forever. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you can't be a part of that. You have to go through Christ in order to get there. And that's important to understand. And, it's, and, and also for us to know that since we have gone through Christ, since we're doing this as, a, as an outflow of our relationship with God, God gives us authority over the enemy. He gives us power. He gives us wisdom. And most of all, He just takes what we do and energizes it and uses it for eternity. We are not adequate for these things, are we? No, we're not. But Christ is. And as the body of Christ, we do these things. We shouldn't be afraid to do these things. We should be eager. Secondly, don't be overwhelmed. I know when you start thinking about all the problems in the world, all the things that we could deal with, even in the Quad Cities, it's overwhelming. There's like there's an infinite supply of problems to be solved. Ways in which injustice rules in our world. And it'll give you a headache if you try to think about it. But let me caution you, that is a tool of the enemy. He wants you to do nothing. And if he can get you to be overwhelmed, that's what you'll do. Nothing. And he's okay with that. Don't be overwhelmed. Because God is the master planner. And Jesus said more than once, you have been faithful in little. I will give you much to work on, to be in charge of. And so I just go back again to this just one example, but Maple Ridge, the fruit that has come from there. Because this church was a part of that effort. We actually, we started um, by connecting with one family. Aunt Andrea got to know 
one family at Maple Ridge. Strong believers. Very close to God. Godly people. And we made a connection with them. We built friendships. There were two daughters and a father and a grandmother. That family, the William family, eventually became members of Bethany, even though they're, they speak Burmese. They also speak some English, but they came here every week, sat right there. Anybody remember Margaret? Woman of God. Man. And, and uh, anyway, they connected us to people. They, we had meetings with the residents at Maple Ridge saying, okay, we're going to do another block party. Who wants to cook? Okay, who wants to serve? Who wants, you know, and she's organizing everybody. And we show up, and this thing is going like crazy. And we did this several years. And then the Lord moved them, that whole family, to Battle Creek, Michigan. I have no idea what in the world they're doing in Battle Creek, Michigan. I'm sorry. If anyone's from there, I apologize. But anyway, they're there. Now, Margaret has since gone home to be with her Lord. And, um, and William is still there, and his two daughters, one of them was married here at Bethany. <clears throat> she has at least two kids now. I met one of them yesterday. And the other daughter, Esther, is getting married in Michigan on Father's Day. And I'm doing the wedding. I'm so excited. It's all the fruit of establishing a relationship and letting God use us in a place. And not only that, but we brought kids, refugee kids, to our youth group week after week after week. Debbie and I took the, the van and then the bus and picked up, up upwards of 12 kids every week. Some, sometimes just a few, but many times more than we could handle. We had to use two vehicles to take all these kids from Rock Island, most of whom were refugees, most of whom came from families that did not worship Christ. And so we had an influence there. From the power of God. Now, I don't know where all those kids went because things just kind of, when, when that family moved away, this, this, this connection, the kids got older and got in sports and stuff, and so they, they stopped coming to, to youth group and stuff. But it, it's not something that went away, okay? And that leads to the, to the third point. Not only should we not be afraid, not only should we not be overwhelmed, but we should be instead confident, because what we start, start, God will surely finish. Whatever we do, however much we can do, and we did what we could for several years, and things just sort of went in another direction, and that was of God. And those people, we still know them, and we can still connect with them, and God is still at work in them. And what they learned from us and saw in us cannot be taken away from them. And God is going to see to it. God will see to it. Whatever we do in his name, he will continue it on even after we're unable to. And we could be confident. I mean, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, you know, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul said it a different way in Philippians chapter 1. And we have to understand the context. This is one of my, my, my favorite little pet peeves. Um, there's some verses we take out of context because the meaning out of context is true. But it's not what the passage says. You know what I'm saying? So Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Mo most of you know it. He who began what? The good thing. He who began the good thing in you will what? Continue. Okay? He will continue to perfect it. That is, to cause it to mature and grow until the day Jesus comes back. He who began the good work in you will continue until, with that, until Jesus comes back. Now, why do I say the good work? Because the context, if you go back to verse 3, I'll just read it. Philippians 1, 3 through 6. Paul says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the first time you heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is fully, finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. 
What is the good work? Spreading the good news. Whatever we do, it, however we could do, however much we could do, God says, great, I'll take it from here. And it doesn't fall away. It doesn't stop. You can be confident, even if we're overwhelmed and we don't know what to do, whatever we do choose to do, that God will, number one, use it. There will bear fruit spiritually for people that will last forever, and God will never let go of it. We are his servants. We are a part of what he does. And if we're not afraid, we could be agents of justice to some degree, as much as is possible, especially if we're willing to point back to Jesus, to be intentional, to be clear, and say, none of this would be possible if Jesus hadn't come and saved me. Without that, I'm really useless here. That's, that's what is open to us. And it's all because of the gospel. Jesus came to heal us spiritually and to bring justice, to make all things right, to reverse the curse. And when he comes back, all things will be made right. And when he comes back, you and I, all of us, will see it. Paul, later on in Philippians talks about Jesus' humility and how he humbled himself, took the form of a a slave and and was made like men and then became a slave and died the death of a criminal on a cross so that one day, at the name of Jesus, every or most knees will bow, right? Uh Uh-uh. Every knee God ever created is going to bow. And every tongue God ever, God ever put in anybody's mouth is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The greatest act of justice of all time is when all of creation proclaims that Jesus is who he said he is. People are confused about that now. Some people don't believe. Some people think he's a myth. They are all, That's unjust. That's not true. It's not accurate. One day, you and I and everyone will know. We will see him, and we will have to bow. Now, the only question is, will you do it willingly or grudgingly? That's what you get to decide now. You're going to get on board, receive his invitation to become part of his family, Obey his command to become part of his movement and enjoy the benefits of his rule in your life or not. You'll be dragged before the throne and forced to kneel and forced to confess. And after that, you will spend eternity without God. I don't think anyone, if they really understood that, wants that. Nobody wants that. But this is what God offers. We just have to believe. We just have to believe what the word of God says and trust that yes, one day he will lead justice to victory and everything will be made right. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the comprehensive nature of the gospel. I thank you, Father, that not only did you provide forgiveness and and, um, reconciliation, but you also provide justice and healing. Father, help us to be a part of that in, in whatever way you choose to use us as a church. Help us not to back away in fear or anxiety, but help us to make bold choices, to be confident, to know that whatever we do choose to do in your name, pointing people back to you, that you will use it and that you will carry it forward. Father, help us to be obedient in this and help us to do so joyfully. Give us your wisdom. Give us a vision of what you would have us to do. 
Father, speak to our hearts. And for anyone listening, if you're online or here in the room and you're not so sure about this, but you want to know more, let me just encourage you to um, get onto our website or grab one of the cards and let us know. And we'll be glad to talk to you some more about what it means to know Christ as your Savior. It's very simple. You just simply decide that you want Jesus to be your Savior. And he will, he will begin, once you do that, he will begin to bring healing in your life. Not changing your circumstances, but changing you. And it's all you have to do is ask and say, Lord, I know I need forgiveness. I know I'm, I'm, I, don't, um, I don't measure up to your standard. I know that, so Lord, I want you to forgive me because of what Christ did, and I want you to come into my life and take over. And it, just pray a very simple prayer like that from your heart, and God will answer. He will, he will say yes, and he'll be there, and he'll be there forever. So Father, I pray for anyone who needs to do that, that you would lead them to do that or to, to, help, to help them connect with us or some other Christian they know to, to talk more about this. And Father, help us to be just in our lives towards others because of what Christ did. Help us to picture the justice of God by being fair to people and not stopping there, but being generous beyond that, the way you are. Lord, help us to be a picture of Jesus. We know we could do that because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So help us, Father to be like you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.